So the first uh, grounds on which uh, someone's consent in a contract can be vitiated is the ground on coercion. Now the Indian Contract Act very clearly says and states that look, you cannot be forced into making a contract, be it a private contract, be it a common contract, or any other contract, because contract is out of your free will and choice. It's a commercial deal or a commercial undertaking. If you wish to do it, do it. Otherwise, uh, you necessarily don't have to do it. Uh, so coercion uh, is, you know, interestingly defined as some kind of a physical force. However, under the Indian Contract Act, it uh, has a special uh, significance because it says that it should be some kind of an act that is punishable by the Indian Penal Code 1860 or threatening to commit an act that is forbidden by the Indian Penal Code 1860, which clearly means the kind of interrelation that Indian Contract Act 1872 has with the Indian Penal Code 1860. Right. So, whatever has been done, you know, the act or the force has to be an offense that is defined under the Indian Penal Code or it has to be something that uh, is prohibited or is threatening to commit an act uh, under the Indian Penal Code. Right. So, if someone, you know, makes you sign a contract at gunpoint or at knife point or by holding your collar, you know, those kinds of actions are something that you would notice the Indian Penal Code clearly says. Uh, is a prohibited uh, kind of an action. Uh, there is a punishment for uh, you know threatening someone's person or threatening someone's property. All of these actions, friends, if they are covered under the Indian Penal Code, definitely those actions then uh, can amount to coercion, and coercion then becomes a ground for you to go and plead, saying that my signatures were got by this force, by this action, and hence uh, the contract should not be made enforceable against me. That uh, amounts to coercion and interestingly you will notice that when we talk about say someone trying to uh, attempt to commit suicide, right? Uh, they say look I will commit suicide if you don't uh, put your signatures under this contract. Now because uh, attempt to commit suicide was there in section 309 of the Indian Code. Today you will notice that there may not be a punishment for attempting to commit suicide. But, you know, there is a kind of a prohibition on suicides or uh, threatening or attempting or abating a suicide, right? So, those actions are very clearly something that courts will hold as being uh, coerced uh, to agreeing or giving your consent and contract. And uh, that is something that you will notice uh, is uh, definitely a ground to vitiate the contract, to set aside the contract. Also, you will notice uh, that when you talk about coercion, friends, please note you may talk about physical force, you may talk about mental force as well. Because, uh, you know, if you like someone and if that person is uh, threatening to commit suicide, uh, it's kind of a mental force, it's not a physical one, it's not like catching a collar. So, that needs to be that kind of a distinction. But both are something that uh, coercion should be able to cover. Uh, to be honest, you know, uh, people are asked to sign contracts even based on blackmails or threats. The threat can be physical, it can be online, it can be verbal. And blackmails are also some kind of, uh, you know, issues that uh, people will have to deal with. You know, we see children blackmailing their parents in giving a release deed or a gift deed. And here, you know, those can be also contractual ones. So, I think we are talking of a larger issue over here in terms of what is free consent and how much free consent is an essential part of dealing with enforcement of a contract. Uh, interestingly, in common law as well as in India, the new aspect that is being now covered is called uh, uh, economic duress. Now, in common law, coercion has always been treated as duress and duress can be to person, it can be to property as well. You know, when I say person and property, please remember, you know, I will say that, look, I will not release this amount to you unless you do something for me, right? So that is like duress to property. It's not to a person, but to property. It can be your property in terms of mobile property, it can be mobile property, it can be cash, it can be advances, uh, so on and so forth. So duress has a very broader uh, coverage as someone would want to argue. And the modern form of duress is uh, called economic duress. This is interesting, considering the fact that, look, the parties are in such, you know, inequitable kind of bargain, and especially, suppose you say government contracts, 
the government has a higher bargaining position, right? Now they may use it or misuse it or abuse it in some context and make the contractor sign on certain papers, right? For example, we have a very interesting uh, question that is often posed. Sir, suppose the L1 in a government contract, you know, he gives a declaration saying that I'm no longer interested in the contract. Can we give the contract to L2? Now, I usually say that, okay, if you wish to do it, please go ahead and do it. However, the problem and the challenge over there is, look, uh, L1 can tomorrow go to the court and say, whatever I signed was purely out of duress, out of coercion, out of economic duress. What is that economic duress? Look, the government officers literally threaten me that, look, if you don't give me the release date, we will blacklist you, we will debar you, and then I have to sign and give to them because I have to protect my future business interest. So these are certain challenges that one will have to be careful about because economic duress is the use of someone's dominant position to actually get consents in a contract, right? Uh, that is what economic duress would often mean. Uh, there are very some interesting cases on economic duress. Uh, you know, workers uh, going on a strike, flash strike, right? And saying that if you don't give us bonus, we will not work, right? Can that amount to economic duress? See, if you're asking me legitimate salary, that will never amount to economic duress because what is legitimate is your right. But if you're asking illegitimate, something that is uh, uh, unreasonable, illegitimate, unreasonable demands uh, can amount to a pressurized kind of a situation economically to which probably the management says, oh, look, there is something that we have to, we have promised to the customers if it is not done, uh, you know, the company will go on liquidation. So we have to agree to this unreasonable, illegitimate strike and demand of the workers and hence we are going to make a promise to pay. Any such consent or a promise uh, that tries to, uh, you know, kind of cover up or, you know, listen to illegitimate demands or expectations or promises will be covered under economic Right? So when you don't want to do it and you are forced to do it in some form because of the economic situation, because you have no other inevitable position to take, right? this can happen with airlines. You know, they, they, they kind of, you know, every now and then flights get cancelled. Right? So they create an economic situation where they said, look, no refund, you either book tomorrow or see, you know, those kinds of situations, I think one has to be really careful about uh, unless they are legitimate, which means uh, legally permissible. They would be illegitimate for which economic duress can be a very important uh, ground to intervene for the courts and say that the contract is not enforceable. Okay? So, interestingly, you also have to understand that what is permissible and what is impermissible. Now, what is permissible, friends, is that uh, people can be persuaded to sign contracts, motivated, promoted, cajoled. Uh, you know, somebody could be convinced uh, to sign a contract. Now, persuasion and convincing doesn't mean coercion. So I think one, we have to clearly understand what amounts to coercion and what is the permissible uh, in kind of actions, deeds, words and conduct that may be necessary to get the consent of the other party. Right? So as soon as the gray line is crossed, it is coercion. Otherwise, I think everyone can use his or her uh, uh, oratory skills, convincing abilities, persuasion abilities, uh, negotiation skills uh, to actually get someone to agree to a contract. That's something that is definitely permissible. So uh, uh, I think it's very clear uh, from this discussion that what amounts to coercion, what does not uh, amount to the same. So um, going forward, friends, we have to understand what is undue influence. Now, Again, here, uh, the permissible aspect is someone can give you proper influence, due influence. What is due to you, you have to be influenced about it. A father can influence a son, vice versa. Uh, an employer can influence his employee, uh, vice versa. You know, look, your, your performance is not good. The company may not retain you. Uh, start looking out for some other job. That's due influence because you are preparing your junior or your colleague uh, for a better future. But undue influence, right? where someone uses his position of dominance uh, in a manner uh, that causes, uh, you know, harm to the other guy and advantages to the one who, uh, you know, is influencing the other party. Undue influence, right? Now, you have to appreciate, friends, undue influence 
uh, emanates from the fact that in contract there are parties who are in dominant positions. Yeah, there are parties, and these are like parties who are like say the hospital uh, dominant position. They agree to decide what to do with you, what terms and conditions will they do the surgery with you. Bankers, banks, they are in a dominant position. You have no you know, great choice in what the banks say as the terms and conditions of their service and their loan. Uh, so there are quite a few of these uh, relations that hold this dominant position. Now, there is nothing wrong about being in a dominant position because that's how the market is. The market is never fair. Uh, obviously, one player is always dominant, like say the teacher student. Uh, isn't the teacher in a dominant position? Isn't the university in a dominant position? I think teachers and universities are dominant positions vis a vis the students. So, probably you will find this in most places. Uh, even employer is in a dominant position vis a vis the employee. So, there is no problem regarding uh, in a position of dominance. The problem is abuse of the dominance. Right? Now, how do you abuse it? Probably you use that position to get an unfair advantage from the other party. Right? Unfair. Fair is okay. Unfair is definitely not okay. So that's pretty subjective, no doubt about it. What is that unfair advantage gained uh, from the influence, from the position of dominance? That would be the critical factor to judge whether such undue influences occur or not. Now, obviously, friends, you have to notice that in our society, there are people who may be susceptible to such kinds of uh, misuse of power or abuse of dominant position. The easiest example to give you is elderly citizens. Now, elderly citizens are fragile, uh, infirm due to age, uh, due to how much they can read, see, watch, understand commercial transaction. And uh, very often they're not your people who are, you know, grabbing the assets of attention and making unfair contracts uh, in those circumstances. Similarly, you have people who are juniors or minors, uh, people who are young. Now, minors don't have capacity to contract, but just because out of 18, you can't certainly expect him to know everything about the commercial transaction. So between 18 and 21, they're still vulnerable uh, in terms of what kind of contracts they do and what is the extent of their understanding of commerce, profitability, etc, uh, etc. Et so, you know, the law says that in certain situations, we have to presume undue influence, right? There are relationships where undue influence has to be presumed unless, uh, you know, uh, refuted otherwise, uh, undue influence exists. So the person who is in the dominant position must say that the transaction was clean, it was fair. That is the kind of presumption. So the burden of proof shifts on the dominant level, right? These are cases of what we call as a relationship that are fiduciary in nature. Right? When they're fiduciary, there is a relationship of trust and confidence. That trust and confidence should not be abused. So in all those relationships, it is the banker, the doctor who have to come to the court and say, look, uh, we have not committed any error of uh, consent. Uh, our influence was fair and we have not gained any unfair advantage. And hence the contract is to be held enforceable. Now, the reason why the burden of proof shifts is because the vulnerable, the elderly, those who viewed that trust, right, should not be made to come to the court and prove that the other person has uh, committed undue influence because it's very difficult to bring that kind of proof to convince a judge or the kind of evidence that is required to tell a judge that undue influence has actually taken place. Because when such influences happen, you yourself probably may not know uh, that it has happened, right, what words were said, what state I was in, um, and etc, etc, right. Now, you notice that undue influence is very common when elderly people sign will, right? When they try to give uh, their uh, expression of intent about how their property must be managed after their death. Usually, undue influence, uh, we have seen a lot of cases, isn't it? Where, uh, say, uh, an elderly person has uh, given his property to his servant or given his property only to one child, uh, excluding everyone else, or has given it to a lawyer. Uh, excluding uh, dependents. We usually suspect that yes, an undue influence might have occurred because when you are in an old age, you are susceptible to those who are very close by who is actually taking care of you. Uh, you know, you want to probably give it uh, uh, all to them. Uh, that's fine if you wish to do it. But if the other person commits a kind of, uh, you know, uh, abuse of that kind of an influence, then yeah, an issue of undue influence definitely comes into place. 
I think the best case for us to, you know, read at this point of time to understand under influence is the case of Alcard versus Skinner. It's a very interesting case of an Oxford student who wanted to sell a property to discharge his debt because he was under huge debt, education and other debts. But luckily he had inherited a property. So he didn't know how to or what to do with uh, this, how to discharge the loan, how to deal with the property. So he goes to his uncle and uh, seeks advice. And the uncle then, you know, directs him to another uh, cousin uh, who was a property dealer. And that cousin now sees a great opportunity. He sees this Oxford student who is in a lot of stress of debt. Uh, he has a property. He doesn't know what to do with it. Look, uh, he's clueless. So this uh, person then says, oh, let me explore the situation. So he goes to this Oxford student and says, look, I've seen your house. Um, it's not of great value. Right? You won't get much money, but you know, I think I'll help you out because you're in so much of it. So I will buy it, uh, but I'll buy it at, uh, uh, at this price. It's a, you know, uh, that's the only price that the property can fetch because it's an old property, so on and so forth. So he convinces the student to make the sale at a very low price, lower than market price to himself. Now here is an advisor who knows the situation and exploits that advice to himself, gaining an unfair advantage from the advice. Now, please note advisors like lawyers or policy brokers, you know, you go to them to seek advice. There's a trust and confidence that their advice will not be uh, misused. It will be an independent advice, right? Suppose you go to a spiritual uh, guru uh, for, you know, some kind of an advice and he misuses his position and uh, makes you give all his property to uh, his ashram. Won't that be misuse of that kind of an advice? Yes, it would be. And that's why you will notice that undue influence is generally done by people of power, people with power, uh, people with position, where they feel that they can misuse their position, exploit the position and actually gain unfair advantage. And contractually, friends, that is something that is not permitted. And the one who is vulnerable, to whom who has agreed to that contract, who has given his consent to the contract because of this influence, at some point of time, when he comes to know that whatever he did was under undue influence, he can go to the court and he can set aside the contract and hold the contract to be water. Right? So that's the very interesting uh, uh, right that is granted to those who have not given their consent in a contract out of free will and choice. Uh, and that's why this uh, makes this uh, discussion on contracts very, very interesting. Now, in today's times, friends, you will notice that most of the contracts are on paper. They are evidenced on paper. Uh, these may not be that relevant uh, as uh, one may want to question. Uh, Sir, so how does undue influence work in modern day contract? Please note, even in modern day contract, just the fact that it is in writing doesn't mean that, look, I might have put my signatures because uh, there was a threat to me. It's on, still on paper. My signature is still on paper. I might have signed uh, in front of the spiritual advisor because the spiritual advisor's aura is right in front of me and you know in that aura uh, or hypnotism I would have uh, given all my property or gifted all my property or transferred all my property to that spiritual advisor. It's a possibility even today. So I think all these concepts though have very traditional uh, connotations. They are all uh, valid even in modern day context and they can be used as evidence, as arguments, as proof to actually vitiate consent in contracts uh, and one must know uh, all of these points to know uh, which are enforceable contracts and which are actually not enforceable contracts. So con to conclude on the, the second aspect of uh, factors that can vitiate uh, free consent, uh, one will have to distinguish between actual undue influence and presumed undue influence. Now, actual undue influence is based on proof that, that you claim in the court saying that your consent was sought by uh, an undue uh, influencer, uh, and uh, this is the fact, and uh, that's how you agreed to the contract. Now, presumed undue influence, please note, friends, the law presumes that in certain kinds of relationship there can be undue influence, and hence uh, it is the other party, the dominant person, who has to. Uh, showed to the court that uh, he did not uh, commit that kind of undue influence. So that's the difference between actual and presumed. Presumed is something that is presumed by law because parties are in such subsisting relationship that there is a higher degree of probability that the other party might have abused that kind of dominant position and have committed 
uh, undue influence. Uh, you know, there have been stories about uh, very famous film actors who have uh, joined the spiritual ashrams or spiritual uh, missions and wherein they uh, did claim that while they were inside this, uh, uh, you know, spiritual uh, ashram or religious ashram, uh, they were under some undue influences. So there have been stories like this, uh, both uh, in India and abroad. And uh, the best case to understand how people can actually influence your mind uh, is the Alcott versus Skinner case. It's an interesting case about uh, a fact that a lady joins uh, a kind of a rigid religious institution. She stays there and during her stay, she decides to donate a lot of this, uh, her property to the religious institution. Uh, and after some time, unfortunately, she is no longer interested to stay. She comes out. Now, once she comes out, she takes more than three years to realize that what she had committed was a mistake and she wanted now to get that back. So she went to the court and said, please give the property back that I gifted because whatever I did so was under undue influence. Now, the court, I think in this case, uh, was inclined to grant her the relief. However, the technical matter here that one should notice, she did approach to the court after three years of, you know, having come to the knowledge that uh, she was uh, unduly influenced. Uh, and three years, you notice, is the limitation time. It is the time within which you can actually uh, uh, exercise your right to treat the contract as being voidable uh, in case of uh, you know, the aspect of undue influence. So, because uh, the limitation time was overshot, uh, the lady did not get relief. But I think if she had gone within the three years uh, of having known that she was undue influence, uh, she would have got a relief because, please note, this is a classic case of the spiritual advisor versus the disciple uh, fiduciary relationship. And the fiduciary relationship in such cases, there is a presumption. And the presumption has to be refuted by uh, the influencer. Uh, and unless uh, the court is satisfied that no unfair advantage has been gained. Now look here, what is the unfair advantage? The spiritual advisor uh, asked the lady to uh, donate property, uh, but not to some third person. It was donated to the ashram or the religious institution itself. So, the advisor misuses the advice. There is a disadvantage that is caused to the other party and an advantage that is very clearly visible. Right? Uh, now, if you gain advantage from your advice, that is very clearly abuse of your uh, trust and confidence that is posed on the advisor and hence the courts uh, are highly inclined to set aside these kinds of arrangements and contracts. I think uh, moving forward, I think one will understand uh, the third aspect that is very, very important is to look at misrepresentations. Now, this is something very, very common in modern day context, in a, a, a context where there is more demand than uh, supply in the market. Uh, it is a context where the market decides to exploit consumers. So today, largely, if you look at the Consumer Protection Act, and in India, we have a new law, the Consumer Protection Act of 2019, uh, which very clearly protects consumer interest in case of misrepresentations. However, the Indian Contract Act probably was the first law that actually decided to protect buyers uh, from misrepresentations. Now, the law on misrepresentation, friends, is very, very critical and important for us to understand because this can happen in modern day contracts very often, especially when you look at online buying of goods. Uh, or hiring of services. Today, everything is digital, everything is electronic. A uh, lot of representations are made to convince uh, persons to actually buy products. And uh, these are very critical factors. And please note, they're not necessarily misrepresentations that happen in consumer contracts. They can be misrepresentations that happen even in business contracts. Now, the term misrepresentation, friends, if you can just uh, divide it for a minute, it is miss and then representation. Now, whenever a contract is made, uh, be it from the seller side or be it from the buyer side, uh, usually let's take from the seller side. Let's assume that the seller has made a product. Now, very often the not he has to describe what that product is. So he has to represent the functionalities 
uh, or what we call as a performance or the capacity of the product. It's inevitable that that's the only basis on which consumers will buy it or anyone else will be interested in. So representations are very, very important for marketability of any kind of a product. Interestingly, misrepresentation means probably those that have been said or stated have actually gone untrue. They have gone wrong. Right? That's what misrepresentation means. Now, interestingly, whenever uh, we talk about misrepresentation, something that has gone uh, untrue, you can probably divide it into two categories. One is innocent misrepresentation, the other is negligent misrepresentation. Now, why we should we divide the same? It is because that, uh, you know, we should understand uh, a particular concept over here called the vendor's puffery. Vendor's puffery means vendors have this tendency to puff their product, right? They, they, they pump the product so much, they puffery the product so much that you are convinced to buy it. So it's quite often that a salesman is employed only to sell the product and he is employed only to tell you the advantages, the goodness, uh, the functionalities, the performance of the product, he has to tell you in such a convincing manner that you actually buy the same. Now, when you talk about this kind of a salesman, he may actually uh, do the representation um, and uh, sometimes commit misrepresentation because he may just go over the board uh, to convince you, right? This is very often that, you know, human beings have this tendency to uh, tell you a little bit more uh, than what it actually is. And he may do so either innocently or negligently. Now, the term negligent means uh, a mind that actually knows what is being said is untrue, uh, but they do so without verifying facts. They do so without actually checking uh, the veracity of the statement that they have been made. So, it's a mind which makes those statements uh, in, in a careless manner. Recklessly, if you can say so. So the mind probably has not checked the facts before stating the same. That is when we say there is negligent misrepresentation, right? Um, so uh, innocent misrepresentation can happen because you know you're not the expert in that product. So you just probably sometimes say, "Yeah, I think this should be done. You know, it should work for you." Right? An elderly person who is selling his car says, "No, no, this is a very good car." They think it is good because that is their belief that it is good. So innocently, I think there are a group of people when they make the say, they commit misrepresentation and it's not done so very deliberately. It's not done with a mischief or with an intention that, uh, you know, you uh, 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 believe the same. Uh, they do it uh, without actually uh, uh, checking uh, really what is essential as facts, right? So these are very interesting connotations. Sometimes, you know, you cannot say, can a misrepresentation actually be innocent? This is a question that we, which is often asked. Uh, it cannot be, but sometimes, you know, just to lower the kind of uh, 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 penalty, if uh, you want to call it, to lower the, uh, uh, you know, fault of the other party, sometimes the courts have used uh, the difference between innocent and negligent. So, you know, one aspect that you have to uh, look here is uh, what is what the counter uh, argument for misrepresentation. The counter argument for misrepresentation is KV tenter. Uh, it means that, look, why should a buyer believe or only trust the representation of the seller? See, seller may say anything, but what was the buyer doing, right? Uh, Buyer also has certain uh, duties, right? He necessarily only does not or should not rely on the representations of the seller. Uh, that's not the, the only action uh, that he can follow up with. Buyers have also a duty and a responsibility, and the duty and the responsibility is let them beware. Buyers beware. That is what Kevit Emptor actually means. Uh, Kevit Emptor, very interestingly, balances the responsibility of the seller and the buyer, right? Uh, but it puts a little bit of higher obligation on the buyer saying, you should have verified the representation. Why just, you know, believe what he says as misrepresentation and have acted upon it? No, you should have actually verified it. So, did you have the responsibility as well? Uh, the other uh, concept uh, that has evolved thanks to the consumer protection law 
is the concept of caveat when data. Yeah, which means uh, let the seller be there. Yeah, uh, because this is a consumer market. The consumer is the key. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, it's important that sellers uh, verify everything before making the sale. Otherwise, they would could be held liable. Now, these two concepts are very very relevant even today. Uh, the buyer cannot go to the court and simply say that the seller is misrepresented. The court is definitely going to ask the buyer. Boss, what did you do? Did you verify? Did you not check what you were saying? Uh, uh, what were uh, your responsibilities when you bought the goods? Did you or did you say why you were buying the goods? What was the, your requirement? If you have actually failed in your duty, why should we hold the seller entirely responsible? Right. So that's a counter thing that one must understand, uh, especially when we start discussing about misrepresentation. Second is this, uh, you know, interesting principle uh, where we call uh, the principle of Uberma Fede. Uberma Fede uh, is important to understand because you will notice that most contracts are contracts of good faith. And when there is contract of good faith, we say there is a higher contract of the contract of utmost good faith. Which means, uh, you know, you should... Uh, actually speak even though you are not required to do so. Now, insurance contracts friends, are considered contracts of Uber Mafidia. Yes, they are contracts of Uber Mafidia. Which means that the insurer, even despite having been asked to say something or disclose something, has a duty to do so. If he does not, then there would be a breach of contract in terms of misrepresentation. So, the duty to speak is there in what we call as uh, the contracts of utmost good faith. Good faith. Utmost good faith means uh, you have to disclose all faults. Don't wait for me to ask. Uh, don't wait for me to uh, you know, say. Uh, so, you cannot actually hide. Uh, you cannot do what we call as concealment. And those are definitely actionable in those contexts. So, certain contracts fit within this uh, Uberama uh, rule uh, and you will notice that unless you have disclosed those kinds of facts, uh, you could be held uh, to be uh, responsible for misrepresentation. The third concept that you would also uh, you know, want to find out over here are uh, representations that are divided under the Sale of Goods Act of 1930. Now you will notice that the Sale of Goods Act was crafted as a special law. It was part of the Indian Contract Act 1872, but later on the Britishers found that for goods and for the sale of the same, there is a special legislation that is required because there are special rights and remedies that could apply just for sale of goods. Now you will notice that goods are tangible commodities, they are mobile property. And hence uh, the Sale of Goods Act says, look, representations can be divided into two kinds or two categories. One kind of representations we should say as conditions. The other kind of representations we must say as warranties. See, conditions, the law says, are so very essential for the main purpose of the contract, the breach of which must give you the right to repudiate the contract. So they are fundamental, they are core. So if the representation is so fundamental and core and they go to be untrue, then you should have the right to cancel the contract, repudiate the contract, which means give the money back uh, uh, is what you can claim. So you return the goods and claim the money back. This is called the law of repudiation. Because you should know that the misrepresentation makes the contract voidable. Now, what does voidable actually mean? It means that uh, if there is a breach of condition, then you can return the goods because there is a breach of some fundamental core, essential uh, 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 you know, part of the product. Uh, and you can claim the money back. So that is the kind of remedy you get for breach of conditions. But in case there is breach of warranty, now warranty is not so very essential, uh, 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 you know, part of the contract. Uh, they are, uh, you know, performance-related uh, representations. Uh, for example, I can give you uh, one instance. Suppose a second-hand car is being sold. If the second hand car has been sold and there is a representation saying that the car gives X amount of mileage, whether the mileage of the car will be treated as condition of warranty. 
I assume that in most cases it should be treated as warranties. So what has been said about the mileage of the car, if that goes to be untrue, that is misrepresentation, then the sale of goods act says you cannot return the car back, you cannot return the goods back. However, for that misrepresentation, you can claim damages. So you will inevitably have to keep the goods, the sale will be done, but for that misrepresentation, you can claim damages. So this is how misrepresentation uh, is divided and you will notice that the sale of goods act says there are certain things that are implied conditions and implied warranties implied by law. For example, that a seller has the title to the goods. This is implied by law. It is a condition. If you don't have title, you cannot transfer it. And if you have done so, I can say that is breach of condition because you misrepresented that you had title and I can uh, seek the return of the goods uh, uh, because it's a breach of condition. So that's an interesting way of division that the Sale of Goods Act has done so that the remedies for misrepresentation are very clearly understood uh, and uh, though the contract is going to be held voidable in both the cases, uh, the, but the remedies are entirely different. So it all depends upon whether the misrepresentation was core or essential, which is condition, or whether it was not so very core or essential, which is to be treated as warranties.